Amen. Many of you have picked up on the theme for tonight for the service, have you? It's Jesus. <laughs> Just help me, it's Jesus. That's a great song, great truth. I mentioned before, but where I sit, I can see, uh, I can see Paul, Brother Paul Green, Beth's husband. And uh, normally while she sings, he has some half silly, in love gaze upon his wife as she's singing right there. You know, usually some, some you know, re really some stupid grin on his face. He's watching his wife, and, and Brother Eric, don't laugh too loudly. I can also see you while, while Miss Sarah sings as well. You have the same look for your wife in that same way. But then I was thinking while, while, while Beth was singing and, and caught Paul's eye, as he sometimes do when she's singing, and, you know, get a little smirk back and forth. I hope that we look upon Jesus in the same way. Mine was turned to that song, well, toward that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful place, in, in his face, wonderful face. The things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I hope when you come to church that we assist and try to make the environment where you can look at Jesus. I don't want you to look at us. Don't look at me. I, I am going to preach like I do most services, but don't look at me. So we sing songs. Don't look at who's singing. Think about who they're singing about. Keep your eyes turned toward Jesus Christ. And that takes us right to Colossians chapter number 1. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians being about Jesus Christ. Colossians written to a church that was at times struggling, a group of saints struggling to, uh, to keep Christ in the proper perspective and the proper place. For us, it would be a battle of priorities and timing and all the distractions of this earth that pulls you and pulls me, just the cares of this life. For the Colossians, it was not only that, but there was some false teaching, some false doctrine that was coming in and distracting them from their view of Jesus Christ. And Paul, I believe, pens the book of Colossians to help this young group of believers now look back at Jesus Christ and look at what he is and who he is, what he has done, and what he wants to do. It's Colossians. So we look at Jesus Christ. And again, if we can tonight, turn our attention toward him. Beginning in verse number 9 tonight, we find our text, Colossians 1, beginning in verse number 9, where Paul writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, For this cause all, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Tonight I want to preach and entitle the message, God's Will. God's Will. You ever wonder what God's will is? You ever struggle with that decision? It, sometimes it comes in the form of an opportunity for us. Should I take this job or shouldn't I take this job? What is God's will? Sometimes it's in the form of a person. Should I marry this person or not? What is God's will? Sometimes it's in the form of finances. Should I do this with my money or do this? Should I buy this or this? What is, help me, God's will. And no doubt, I believe, clearly taught in Scripture that God orders the steps of a good man. God has a will, a path for you and for me. I find that in the early pages of the Old Testament when I look at the children of Israel who were led by fire and cloud, day, night. And wherever this, this uh, representation of the presence of God moved, if the pillar of fire moved, the children of Israel were supposed to follow. So that if it went to the left, they were to go to the left. If it went north or right, they'd go this way or this way. Whatever it went, they were to follow. When it stopped, they stopped. When it moved, they moved. In a very direct way, God cared about their exact steps through the desert. And God has not changed in his thoughts for you and I, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And that is an understanding that we must come to, what does God have for us? But in this particular passage, Paul, in the following verses, begins to lay out, I believe, some key components to what God's will is for every single believer. 
In this passage, he will not necessarily break down what choice we ought to make in every given situation. Should I buy the red truck or the blue truck? Though I believe the Bible speaks toward that end. I believe that God does care what choices you make in life, even about what color truck you buy. You say, well, prove that from the Bible, Pastor. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. All right, how about that little, little verse? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or... Only the big things in life. Only the things with, with husbands and wives and kids. Only the things about church. No. Or whatsoever ye do. Would that include buying a truck? Yes, it would. Absolutely. Do all to the glory of God. That means that there is a way to glorify God in how we eat, how we drink, and how we buy trucks. But here in this passage, we find some broad strokes for the will of God for us. I read about uh, this illustration, a sermon illustration, that when I finished reading it, I thought it would fit tonight because it was completely wrong. Normally when I find illustrations, I find them because they support a point. This one supports the sermon, but not for the way they meant it. It's a story about that, that, a, that a man used, or uh, that a pastor used, about a boy trying to learn math or arithmetic. And like our current arithmetic math books, the answers, for at least the odd questions, are in the back of the book. Are the answers still in the back of the book, young people? They're still back there? Yes, no, yes. Levi says yes. Oh, Landon says yes. So at least some boys figured out where they're at. Right? The answers are in the back of the book. The odd, at least when I was in school, the odd questions in the back of the book. Teachers would do a few things. One, they would... They would do the odd in class and make you do the even at home. Terrible. You probably do that, don't you, Carrie? With your... they don't, they, oh, they don't have answers in the book. Okay. Oh, you make your kids figure them out all by themselves. That's terrible. <laughs> in the sermon illustration, the, the man, the, the preacher, was, was talking about this, how there was this boy trying to learn arithmetic, and so the teacher assigned the student the odd questions and said, now listen, don't look at the answers in the back of the book because you'll be cheating. Well, sure enough, this young man, all right, like some young men, not, not every young man, there's a lot of honest ones out there, but this one wasn't as honest, and he found that it was easier to look at the answer first and then solve the problem toward the answer. Would be easier, wouldn't it? Answer is 12, how do you get there? And the sermon illustration went on to, to talk about how, well, this boy never learned arithmetic. He went on to say this, that, that God treats us the same way, and he can force us to work out problems because it's by struggling through problems that we can develop into the kind of mature people that God wants us to be. Now, it sounds really nice at face value that God lets us learn and mature and grow so that we don't just jump to the end. The problem that I have is that God, through his word, gives us the answers. All right, we face the problems in life, but God gives us the answers to life's problems right here. And he doesn't tell us not to look. In fact, he says, go ahead and look. Memorize the answers so that when you come to the right test, you have the right answer. What's the right answer? Trust in God. No matter what the problem is, the answer fits. Oh, you cheated. You cheated. You looked at the answer book. You looked at the answer key. Yep, I did. And right here we have an answer key for us in 1 Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12 about God's will. Let's continue on in our sermon tonight, looking at verse number 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Lord, I pray that you would help us in these next few moments. Lord, just a few minutes we have together tonight. And as we look at your word, Lord, I ask that you would touch us. You've promised that your word would not return void. Lord, I ask that tonight our hearts would be tender to your spirit and sensitive to your word. Lord, would you show us areas that we have resisted your will in our life and are not pleasing you. Lord, I ask you to touch us and change us tonight. May we leave in obedience to you 
Lord, help me as I speak. I need your help tonight, please. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. These verses, verses 10 through 12, I find four characteristics of the will of God. If you're taking notes, there'll be four words that begin with the letter L tonight. Letter L. Four characteristics from, these passage, from this passage about the will of God. Four characteristics that we all ought to be displaying if we are truly saved and following Jesus Christ. This will not be a list of, well, don't go here or go here. Don't buy this, but buy this. But these are some broad concepts, some large spiritual characteristics, some spiritual attributes of someone who is trying to know the will of God. Paul says, I'm praying that you will know the will of the, will of the Lord, will of God, in spiritual understanding. So four things tonight as we look at this passage. The first thing we see is found in verse number 10. And really in those first about seven or about eight words of that passage, uh, verse number 10, where the Bible says, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Can you read that with me, please? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord. The first word tonight, the will of the God, the will of the Lord, the will of God for us, for you and I, is to live the right way. To live the right way. That word walk means to live. It does not mean just to walk or how you move your feet. Now some of you know that. But I want you to be confused by that. That we're supposed to walk worthy or live in a suitable manner. The Bible goes on to say that is pleasing. Or says unto all pleasing. Who do you think we're supposed to please as we live? I know I didn't announce we're going to have a pop quiz, but let me try it again. Who do you think we're supposed to please as we live? God. God. So, so does, that, does that tell me, does that tell you that there is a way to please him? Yes? And a way not to please him. You see that? If I'm supposed to walk worthy unto all the Lord, unto all pleasing, then there must be a way that does not please God that does not honor God, that is not worthy, that is not suitable of the Lord. And Paul says, I want you to understand this young church at Colossae, as you focus on Jesus Christ, that you need to live in a suitable manner, that you walk worthy, not of your own inventions or of your own creations or of man's ideas, but of the Lord. That means I'm not supposed to be as concerned about you as I am about him. We have ideas for everyone else is walk. I know how you can walk worthy. But I need to be concerned about my walk before God. There is a way to live. There is a way not to live. There is a way that is suitable. And there are ways that are not suitable. That means that not everything is acceptable in Christ's economy. Some things are not acceptable. Now, I, I say this because we live in a day and age, in a spiritual day and age, where there are false teachers who want us to believe that God doesn't care how you live. God doesn't care how you walk, just that you walk. As long as you're saved, that's it. No big deal, this is great. As long as, you, long as you and Jesus are okay, then whatever else you do is fine. And Paul does not say, I want you to walk unto the Lord. But he adds that little word, I want you to walk worthy. I want you to live in a way that is suitable for your Savior, Jesus Christ. When I believe when Paul uses that word unto the Lord, he's referring, and often in Paul's writings, he'll say the Lord or the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul had a desire to live for Jesus Christ, that he would be counted worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ, that when he stood before God, that it would be said of him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Notice in this particular walking worthy aspect, the way to live, that there's a person and his name is Jesus. We sang about him tonight, did we not? We heard about him tonight. His name is Jesus. You ought to be concerned about your walk in relationship to Jesus Christ. 
I read an illustration. One that fits the sermon this time. About General Napoleon Bonaparte. He was making his rounds to different guard posts, and he found a soldier asleep at his post. The great general asked the soldier, what is your name? And the soldier responded, my name is Napoleon. And the general said, what did you say your name was? The soldier repeated himself, my name is Napoleon. Reportedly, the general said, well, soldier, begin to live up to your name or change it. My friends, we have a name. We have a name. We're Christians. Little Christs. We're supposed to be like Jesus Christ. So maybe it's about time we started living up to that name. Begin to walk worthy in our dealings, in our manner of conversation. The Bible word, how you live, the, the choices you make, the decisions, the way you react in situations. I mean, at your job, you have the name of Jesus, so live that way. Walk worthy of a Christian at your job. When you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off, walk worthy of the Lord. You have the name of Jesus on your heart, on your life. Walk worthy of the Lord. And the cashier gives you too much change back. Walk worthy of the Lord. When your taxes are filed and you're tempted to be dishonest on your taxes, walk worthy of the Lord. When your neighbor encroaches three and a half inches onto your property line, well, that's different. Walk worthy of the Lord. When railing accusations are fired against you, walk worthy of the Lord. When friends betray you and your name is dragged through the mud, walk worthy of the Lord at home, at work, when you're out and about, at the gas station, at Walmart, at Sam's Club, wherever you go, whatever you do, walk worthy because of the person and his name is Jesus Christ. There's a person, there's a path. Right and wrong. Right and wrong. Well, I wasn't raised that way. You're right. You're right because your father naturally is the devil. Before Jesus Christ came into your life and my life, our father is a liar and a deceiver and a slanderer and wicked. So no matter how you were raised is not an excuse for not walking worthy of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know any better. You have the answer key. You have the answer key. He'll tell you how to walk worthy. There's a path, right and wrong. But I love the purpose inside of this verse where it says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. What does it mean when God is pleased? We see a couple examples in Scripture. In Scripture, when God was pleased, he speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Those around took note of the voice from heaven. Boy, I wish I could have been there that day. Can you imagine hearing the voice of God through your ear? Wouldn't that be amazing? Mount of transfiguration, God spoke in my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. The disciples that were up there with him did not wonder who it was. They knew it was God. They didn't wonder if, if maybe uh, Matthew had snuck up on the mountain of transfiguration. No, they knew it was God's voice from heaven. Other time in scripture talks about his voice and people thought it was thunder or something like that. Just a booming voice. God, I don't think, has a weak voice to you. I think it was a strong voice. What does it look like when God is pleased? Puts a smile on his face. Men, you ever bought your wife flowers? When you weren't in trouble? No, no, what's that like, Pastor? I don't know, but <laughs> fit my notes well. No, you buy your wife flowers just, just because. Just because. Give her those flowers and she's got that little, that little smile. Well, what are these for? What'd you do? Honey, these are because I love you. You know, and then that sweet response from your wife or your girlfriend, aww, 
You're so sweet. Well, yeah, I know that. No doubt about that. <laughs> Ladies, you ever make that favorite meal of your husband? For me, it's ribeye steak. Favorite thing. One meal left in the world, I'm eating ribeye steak. Like, that'll kill you. Well, one meal left, I'm not worried about it that time. Honey, what's this for? What do you want, honey? Two horses? Three horses? I say, honey, thank you. That was real special. You did that. When you walk worthy, can I say it this way? You can put a smile on the face of Jesus Christ. I want to put a smile on his face, don't you? That's my child. There are times in Scripture he took note. Remember, God took note of Job, did he not? God said, that's my servant. And he pointed him out to the devil. He said, that's my servant Job. Have, have you noticed him? I think what he's saying in Job chapter 1, the devil, I'm pleased with him. I am pleased with him and his life and his faith. We can read in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter on faith, where we see what it looks like when God is pleased. You and I can please him. And the, this passage tells us we can walk worthy and please him. But beyond that, it is a profitable walk, being fruitful in every good work. That means that what you do will be profitable for God. I don't want to waste my time here on earth. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to live a day and be done with a day and find out that, you know what, I just spent an hour, spent a day, spent a week, nothing was accomplished. I want to live a life, I want you to live a life that please, not only pleases God, that is profitable for God. You and I may not see it now, but if we walk worthy, suitable to him, it'll be a profitable life, a profitable life, a father and a son Went to a small western town back in the gold rush days. They were there to see the father's brother. The boy's uncle, they'd never met him before. Or the boy had never met his uncle before. All of a sudden, across the town, the father said to his son, there's your uncle right there. And the boy said, well, dad, how do you know that? And the father responded, son, I know him. Because he walks exactly like our dad used to walk. And I wonder, my friend, if someone could point across to you or to I by our life and say, I know them, they're a Christian. They know Jesus Christ because I can see Christ reflected in their walk, in the way they live. You see, the will of God is that we live the right way. Number two, the will of God is that we love the right things. Look at the end of verse number 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. If you want to know what another aspect of the will of God, it is to love the right things. And what ought we to love? We ought to love the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To love the knowledge of God. People will find a hobby, people will find the activity, and they will be all in on a hobby or an activity. It could be a favorite sports team. It could be a way to smoke meats. It could be a, a, a sport. It could be finding deals. But you'll find that people, when they love something, will immerse themselves inside of that love, whatever it may be. Last year, the Lord blessed us and I got a smoker. I'm hearing that's like a midlife crisis kind of thing. I don't know if it is or not, but I enjoy smoking meat. Notice I clarified what I was smoking. Because <laughs> so I know you all have those pagan minds. Yeah, I know that. Smoking, oh, pastor, oh, look at that. No, no, smoking meat. I'm that guy where I jump all in and I'm watching YouTube videos. My family, are the, they're, they're, they're the guinea pigs. And they got other people, they're making the guinea pigs. Like, I'm going to smoke this. Do you like this? And they're like, oh, no, that was terrible. Do it again. And I'm like, okay. The Bible is telling us here, Paul is telling the, the, the church of Colossae that you ought to love God so that you increase your knowledge about him. That means there's an attention to Jesus Christ. You must make it a point to increase in the knowledge of God. Are you increasing in the knowledge of God? Are you learning about him? It takes attention and it takes intention. It means it has to be done on purpose. One of this past week, how much you increased in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
I'm here at church, aren't I? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. But you learn about Jesus Christ every time you, you open up the word of God. One day a young man came to Socrates, the great philosopher. Traveled 1,500 miles, and he said to the great philosopher Socrates, I have traveled 1,500 miles for wisdom and learning. I want learning, so I come to you. The great philosopher Socrates said, well, follow me. And he took the young man around down the way to the seashore. They waded out to the water until they were up to their waist as the story went. And Socrates said to the young man, do you want wisdom and learning? And the young man said, yes, I came 1,500 miles to you, great Socrates, to learn of wisdom and learning. Yes, I want understanding. Please help me. And the story goes that Socrates took the young man and held him under the water. The young man began to gasp for breath. And still Socrates held him underwater. The man began to flail, began, to, I guess, to, to think he was going to drown. And still Socrates held him underwater. When the man had almost drowned, Socrates pulled him out of the water, took him to the, to the shore, to the, to the shore, and left him there. And Socrates left him there and walked back to town. A while later, as the story I read went, the young man came back to Socrates and said, what are you doing? Why did you do that? I came 1,500 miles and I want to learn from you, great philosopher Socrates. The great philosopher said, when you were under the water, what was the one thing you wanted more than anything else? And the young man wisely said, I wanted air. And Socrates said this statement, when you want knowledge and understanding as badly as you wanted air, then you won't have to ask me for it. My friends, when you want Jesus Christ as badly as you want to breathe, as badly as you want to live, he'll be found of you. Not only is there a way to live in the will of God, there's a way to love in the will of God. And I wonder if your love to know Jesus Christ competes with your desire to live. You see, I'm afraid we just add Jesus Christ to our life. But he's not our life. Later on in the book of Colossians, Paul will pen these words, but when Christ, who is our life. He can't just be part of your life and my life. That's not what the Bible teaches. He is my life. He must be more important than the very next breath that I take. Will of God, how to live, how to love, how to lean. Look in verse 11. The Bible says, strengthened with all might. How do we live? How do we love? Only found in the strength of Jesus Christ. Energized by Jesus Christ. It is an exclusive energy. You can only be plugged into one source. You're either drawing strength from Jesus Christ or you're not. You can't be plugged into two places at once. You're either gaining strength from Jesus Christ, you're either living in his strength, or you're not. And it doesn't mean that you can't put on a good show and have good actions. You can fool me, and you can fool your family, you can fool your boss, but you can't fool Jesus Christ. You're either resting in his strength, you're either drawing from his strength, you're either being energized by Jesus Christ, he's either giving you the power that you need, or he's not. And if he's not, it's not his fault. Because the Bible is so powerful in this statement when it says, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. That word glorious has the idea, uh, two ideas in it. One, that it is magnificent. Christ's power is magnificent and that that power belongs to God you see, what the Bible is teaching us is that when we, lean, when we are strengthened, when we lean on Jesus Christ, we are strengthened not just by regular power, but by power that belongs only to God, supernatural power. You have access to that kind of power. It's exclusive. It's excessive. Sometimes men will buy a tool, chainsaw, Lawn mower, maybe a truck. Women, you don't understand this, but I'll help you here if I can tonight. Men, we buy these tools and they, 
They come rated with, with motors, right? You're at the store looking, and there's this, this chainsaw with a teeny, tiny motor, right? This medium-sized chainsaw. And then there's excessive motor chainsaw. Big warning, only to be used by a real man. <laughs> That's the one I need to buy right there. Men, why do we buy that? Because <laughs> I may need that power sometimes if I ever cut down a sequoia. <laughs> I can. I can. Honey, why do you need 4,000 horsepower in your truck? Well, you never know when I got to pass someone on I-75 in the face of oncoming traffic, in the midst of a tsunami. I can. The power of Jesus Christ is excessive. It is excessive. It is greater than any tool you and I could ever, ever buy. Years ago, I was uh, able to borrow a vehicle, a Cadillac Escalade, from a man named David Coffin. Some of you know him. He's the one that actually connected my wife and I when we were still single. And he saw something in us that thought we ought to be together. And I guess this many years later, 16 years later, we're going to stay together. We'll stick it out. He went on town one weekend, and he knew that I just had a, a little vehicle. He said, listen, you want to borrow my Cadillac Escalade? Brother, I should probably remember this. Man, I'd never driven a vehicle that nice in my life before. I couldn't even remember how much that thing would cost. It was decked out with leather, big old V8 in that Cadillac Escalade. We took it out there, took it over some friends in that, and in that Escalade, boy, drove over a few places. Man, I thought, I thought I was something driving this Cadillac Escalade around. You know what it is? I'm going to go to McDonald's. Why? Because I got a Cadillac Escalade. A nice vehicle. You know, I am 22, 23 years old, driving a Cadillac Escalade, worth, worth more than I probably am today, to this day, right? Boy, I thought I was something. It was pretty quick. How quick? Well, as quick as my motorcycle went to 25 miles an hour. That quick. When we are with Jesus Christ, we don't only think we're something, we are something. Not because of me but be, or because of you, but because of Jesus Christ. Christ. And then notice in this verse, when you are living in this kind of strength, look at that verse, verse 11, when we're strengthened with his might, according to his glorious power, what happens, end of the verse, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. You want to know if you're living in the strength of Jesus Christ, you'll have patience and steadfastness. You can claim to be living in the strength of Jesus Christ, but if you aren't patient in tribulation, if you are panicking and full of anxiety, you are not living in the strength of Jesus Christ. That's what that verse says. That that strength of Jesus Christ, a marker of that is patience, all right, endurance in trials, and steadfastness or long-suffering. There's a fortitude there because of Jesus Christ. So if you want to know if you're living in the strength of Jesus Christ, just check if you have that kind of attitude in your life with joyfulness. Again, to remind you of Paul, when he had that, he sang in prison. Endurance, steadfastness, with all joyfulness. You're whining and complaining? Guess what? You're not strengthened by Jesus Christ. You can say you are. That's not what my verse says. That's not, not, not what my Bible says. The answer key tells me, if I'm strengthened by Jesus Christ, I'll be walking through this trial and saying, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for being in control. Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something. Thank you. We see in this passage God's will, how to, how to live, how to love, how to lean, and lastly tonight, how to look. How to look. Look at verse number 12, if you would, please. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, in light. You see, if you live in the will of God, then you'll have a different outlook on life. You'll give thanks to the Father. For what? For the inheritance. It's a privilege. God is my Father. There's a portion. I'm partakers of His inheritance read about two friends who met each other on the street one looking very forlorn very sad the other friend said why are you so down he said i'd tell you a story he said three weeks ago my uncle passed first friend i'm so sorry he said no no don't be he left me forty thousand dollars 
Well, you should be happy. You know, last week, my parents passed. I'm so sorry. No, no, don't be. They left me a quarter of a million dollars. He said, wow, all this money, you, you, you must be at least somewhat blessed and pleased. Wow, he goes, no, no, this week, nothing. <laughs> Come on, Christian, isn't that how we live sometimes? Isn't that how we live sometimes? Lord, you saved me. You gave me a home in heaven. I have a privilege of a, of a heavenly father who loved me and cares for me. I have a, a, a mansion waiting for me. I have an inheritance waiting for me. But this week, nothing. This week, nothing. Boy, God forgot about me. This week, nothing. No. The will of God is for us to look at things differently. Giving thanks unto the Father. Why? Because he's my Father. And I've been made a partaker of his inheritance. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that ye should show forth the praise of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. My friends, this passage is all about Jesus Christ. And when Jesus is at the center of my life and your life, we will walk worthy, we will live differently. We'll live in a suitable manner. We will love to know about him. We'll want to look in his face. We will lean on him, be strengthened by his might. And we will look at things differently. If those things aren't there, then you're not in the will of God. If you're complaining, come back to the will of God. If you're strengthened by your might, come back to the will of God. If you're filling your mind with everything else out there but not the knowledge of Jesus Christ, come back to the will of God. If you're living life just like you want to, come back and do the will of God. Lord, help us tonight. Because of your son Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be different. Lord, tonight in a practical sense, these things ought to be evident in our life. Lord, may we be honest tonight that as you have touched us, that we'd respond to you. My friend with heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, in a moment the piano will play, but I wonder if tonight the Lord touched your heart. Where maybe you love Jesus. Maybe you claim to be a follower of Jesus. But the words of scripture perhaps illuminate an area in your life that you've not been showing what a real Christian is like. Maybe how you live, what you love, what you lean on and what you look at. In a moment we'll stand. And when we do, I'd ask you just respond to Jesus. Just respond to him. Let him touch you. Look full in his face so he can look and be reflected in our life. Lord, may we be honest, respond to you tonight. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.